Hey, good evening. I, uh, I'm glad to see you guys. I'm very, very glad to be here. Um, I woke up a couple of weeks ago in the morning, and one of my favorite things to do is right out of the gate, I put on a pot of coffee uh, and start my day off that way. Got up, put the pot of coffee on, things are starting out great, and I'm getting ready to go to work. Uh, my daughter's graduated at this point. She's actually going to work for us for the summer, so she's up at the same time getting ready to go to work. And, uh, you know, just kind of starting our day. And I see her in the hallway, and she makes this comment. She's like, hey, Dad, I, I went downstairs last night when I got home. It was late. I went down into our, that storage area down in the basement, and I just want to let you know that the floor's wet. I'm like, what? Okay, let me just say, and I'm not picking on you, but there is a couple of things you wake your parents up for. Fire and water, just generally speaking. Wake up. Those are wake-up issues. Um, but grace to her. So she's like, and I'm thinking in my mind, like, oh, it must not be that bad. And she goes, no, it's, it's pretty bad. And I think it's been going on for a long time. And I'm like, what? So then I'm just like, I'm in that full on dad being dad mode. And I like start getting blustery and like, I gotta, gotta, gotta. So I race down the stairs, you know, being grumpy about it, let's be honest. Uh, and I get downstairs and I'm thinking, it can't be that big of a deal. You know what I mean? It can't be that big of a deal. And I walked down our stairs in, in this area in our basement. Like the only way I can describe it is I just don't go down there very often. My boys have both graduated. They're both married, you know, one's in Phoenix, one's in Kansas City. So they're not down there really much. And I don't, this area of the basement, I don't really go in. It's just like where storage stuff is, like Christmas decorations. And who needs those in June unless you're doing the alternative? Um, so anyway, I, I, I just don't go down there. So I walk down there, I turn the corner, go in this area of the basement. And all of a sudden my feet are just like sloshing like just sloshing everywhere. And I'm like, okay, this is like really, really bad. Turn the corner into like where all the storage stuff is. And I can just see like, we've got a lot of Rubbermaid tubs down there, like those plastic tubs, but there's a lot of boxes. And all the boxes have like wicked up moisture. So they're all wet. And then I, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. It's wet everywhere. Like it's gone underneath the walls. It's gone out in this like living area. Like it is wet, wet, wet. Like. It's spread everywhere. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me, man. Finally, I walk over. I'm like, where in the world? Like, because I can't hear anything. And I walk back and above our hot water heater is this little bitty pipe in this one little valve, not even attached to hot water heater. Okay. This one little valve has failed. Like it, it's even a little piece in the valve that failed. And it's just like drip, drip. Drip. It's not even a big flow. Like, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I don't know how many months it had been going on. Like, the last time I remember being down there was like Christmas. So this has been going on. I don't ever go in there unless my wife is like, go down and get this. Like, okay, I'll do that. But there's no reason why I really go into this area other than to just store stuff. So this drip has probably been going on, I don't know, maybe since like February or something like that, March. It's fine. It's bad, man. One little drip is just completely soaking like all of the carpet in our basement, the carpet pad. And so then I start carrying boxes out and I start looking at the boxes and they've got mildew on them. And then as soon as you see that, like, you know that smell when you leave like a gym bag in your car too long? Like that smell? It's like, bleh, and I can just smell that smell everywhere I go. It's like, it's just nasty. But I'm busy, man. I got to come hang out with you guys and move. My son has got like travel ball, baseball. Like I got a lot going on right now. I don't have time for this. You know what I want to do? I want to just ignore that drip and I just want to go, I just want to Febreze it. Like I just want to spray. Let's just get rid of the mildew. Let's get rid of the smell. No one will know. You know no one have any idea this happened. That's what I want to do. What I don't want to do is I don't want to do all the work it's going to take to fix this stupid drip. That's what I don't want to do. And I'm just mad. And I realized if I don't fix a drip, it's eventually going to soak my entire basement. Everything's going to be filled with mold. It's going to be a train wreck. Nobody will want to come to our house because it just reeks. But I don't want to deal with it. I mean, I just want to spray it. And I want to walk away and act like, no, nah, I didn't know. What are you talking about? There's a drip down there? Like, but it's bad. And it just starts to stink. You can smell the mildew. I think sometimes something similar happens in our churches. Like, I think there, there are occasions where we get to the point where people show up, and I know it's not like a real drip. I mean, maybe it's not water, but sometimes people walk in and they can smell that drip of, like, anger, that passive-aggressive drip in our youth groups and in our churches of where we just don't get along, but we try to fake it. Or, or they can smell the resentment. They can smell the jealousy. They can smell the envy. And all of a sudden that drip, 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 people show from the outside and they're like, man, man, what is that funky smell? Like, what is that? I had two Amandas who were in my youth group. Honestly, two of 
two of the most remarkable girls I've had in youth group. They really were. These sophomore girls were incredible. Like, blown away by their spiritual maturity, blown away by like how many kids they brought to our youth group, completely floored by like just how much they created such a positive culture in our group. Like these two girls were like spiritual lions in our group in all good ways. Like they were forces to be reckoned with at their school they were, and our youth group they were, and, and it was all positive until Dan. Oh, Dan. Dan. Daniel, my goodness, bro. Like I like Dan. He's awesome, but he's not all that, okay? Like, he wasn't worth, like, what happened. Like, really, Dan? Like, these two girls found out best friends, found out they both like the same guy. Yeah. Yeah, best friends. They confide in each other one night. Like, that worked. Just kidding. You should do that. But they confide in each other. They both like Dan, and then they're like, oh, okay, well, neither one of us will like him, man. I'm like, oh, boy. And the next thing you know, man, it is all out war. And it's like... It's ridiculous, man, over Dan of all people. Like, Dan, like Dan's cool and all. Like, I like Dan. Dan's a great kid in our youth group. But Dan, like, we're going to wreck a youth group over Dan? And then all of a sudden it did, man. These girls, man, had brought friends to Christ. They brought probably like 15, 20 kids to our youth group over, over a year. Like, and then they, like, started fighting with each other and not getting along and arguing. And then all the kids they had brought were just like, forget this. I don't want to be part of it. It's like they, like, had some sort of secret, like, fantasy football draft for friends because then their friendships, like, friend groups broke apart based on the Amandas. And, like, Dan's just kind of like, hey, I like them both. You know, it's like one of those things, like, yeah, you know. <laughs> and it's just like a train wreck. And you could just smell it, man. You could smell it. And I watch these two girls just because of their anger and resentment toward one another their inability to forgive finally caused them to completely drift apart, and it wrecked things, man. It wrecked. I mean, it absolutely wrecked things. C.S. Lewis makes this comment. I love this quote. I'll read it. He says, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea. Everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until, <laughs> until he has something to forgive. Man, that's me. I love talking about forgiveness tonight. I love having that conversation until I've got something to forgive. We all want to recognize, we think forgiveness is a great idea. We should all forgive, except for her or except for him. It's hard, man. Forgiveness is a beast. I mean, we live in a world of Karens and cancel culture where every time we open our eyes, whether it's a news feed or a social feed, someone's trying to feed us some line of who we're supposed to be mad at now. Everywhere we look, man. And for me, that feed usually just feeds my sinful nature and it charges, it, it causes me to feel, who am I supposed to be mad at again? I, wait, I forgot, am I mad at them anymore? Have we canceled them? Like, what's going on today? And not just like at a, at a large level with media and social media but, media, but sometimes even at an individual level, I struggle with that, man. And for me, I'll, I'll tell you what, here's where forgiveness hurts me the most. If you hurt me genuinely, no big deal. Like I can get over that pretty quick. I, I got pretty thick skin. Like I, I bounce back quickly from my personal grievance. But my word, man, if you hurt like a group of people that I love, or you hurt like a community of friends, or you hurt like my family, like, oh man, now I want a pound of flesh, bro. <laughs> like you're going to get yours. And that's, man, that's where I have a hard time. I don't know about you, man, but for me, forgiveness is a beast. And I realize that I really come down, I got two options when I get angry, when I get mad, when I get frustrated, when, when I feel like somebody's done me wrong, I get two options. One is I can make them pay. And man, some of us know what that feels like. We kind of like making them pay. I mean, you can make them pay, you get to that point where, and it looks different for everyone in the room. Sometimes making pay is that cold shoulder, I'm just going to withdraw a relationship and act like they don't exist anymore. You know what it means to make them pay. Some of you guys have been on the receiving end of that, and many of you have been on the giving end of that. Where somebody's wronged you, so you're just going to withhold relationship and just completely, utterly ignore them. Some of you will viciously confront. I mean, you will flat go after them, man. If somebody does you wrong, they better buckle up because they're going to get it, man. And you don't mind. Or even if the viciousness isn't you like grabbing a hold of them and shaking them, man, your words, whoo, they are like daggers, man. And you choose them carefully and you choose them wisely. And man, you can throw them like throwing stars, man, and put them right through their heart. Like you know how to hit them. And you can confront them viciously. We can do that. I think sometimes we even like do this whole dumb thing that doesn't exist like karma. We just wish bad things to happen to them. Other times we'll just destroy their reputation. 
We'll just run them into the ground with our mouth, you know, and, and, and honestly, we'll kind of play it off. Well, you know, I don't know if this is true or not, but did you know? And we'll plant seeds about other people all over the place just to destroy the reputation. For some of you, man, it happens here where your thumbs are just flying on a cell phone and you're putting out information or a story or, or framing a story how you want it framed. And all of a sudden, you're trying to alienate them from friends. You're trying to alienate this from this group. You're trying to ruin their reputation. And I know this, that for me, when I get into that payback mode, usually my payback escalates. And most of the time, my payback is worse than the actual offense, man. And I think sometimes what also happens is I find myself at times marginalizing. And not necessarily me. I, I don't know that. I think we, we can all do this. We can marginalize entire groups of people. One person from a store does something we don't like. I'll never shop at that place again. They're all terrible. Like, you have one bad experience and half of it was probably your fault. Or all of a sudden you find that you, you'll marginalize entire swaths of people. Like, somebody does this and all of a sudden you'll, you'll write that off as like, man, that is all guys are that way. Or all girls are that way. Or all white people. Or all black people. Or all Asians. Or all Latinos. And we just marginalize entire swaths of people because of our offense with one individual that we, want to, we won't forgive. All coaches are like that. All teachers are like that. All pastors, all churches. And our inability to deal with our forgiveness causes us to actually completely demean huge groups of people. Or we can forgive. We can pay it back or we can forgive. Let me tell you what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not excusing behavior. It's not. It's not just like forget it, let it go, just forget about it, it ever happened. No, 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 it's not that. It, it's not just letting it slip your mind over time that somebody did something bad to you, did something wrong to you, and like, I'm just going to do my forgets to forget all about it. That, that's not forgiveness, just forgetting about it. it. It's not controlled politeness. Like, some of you guys are masters at this. I can be a master of this. Like, you've got somebody you don't like, like, hey, <laughs> nice to see you. I hope you know my passive aggressive handshake that I hate your guts, you know? Or you'll sit there and you'll look at them like, hi, yeah, great to see you too. Don't like you at all. Does my smile tell you that? You know? We do that kind of stuff with, with, with people. We'll do this controlled politeness where they know and we know, man, we don't like them. Or forgiveness is also not ignoring accountability. Doesn't mean you just forget that it happened and act like they shouldn't be held accountable. That's not forgiveness. And it's not trying to fake it till you make it. Let me tell you what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is dealing with real sin and debt. Forgiveness means you face the offense head on for what it was, an offense. It does mean at times that you need to confront someone on their behavior. But I'll tell you this, forgiveness is granted. It is never earned. And here's a hard part that I had to learn. Forgiveness, forgiveness gets to the point that you stop seeking revenge where they suffer. And you choose to take that revenge, to push it down in submission to Jesus. And you choose to suffer in their place. You choose to bear the pain, submit it to the Lord. That's what forgiveness is. And I'll tell you what, man, it is extremely hard. And truthfully, in my life, sometimes it feels like death. If you get your Bibles, we're going to look at you excited now. We're going to, look at, we're going to be looking at, uh, at the book of Matthew. Okay, you can turn to Matthew chapter 18. We'll start at verse 21. Matthew 18, 21. You get house lights up for people that have got their Bibles open, want to take notes, all of that. Just bring lights way up. Matthew 18, 21. Let's read it. Uh, I'd like to wait for you to get there, but I'm going to read this a few times so you'll be with me. Matthew 18, 21. Okay. 18, 21, here we go. Um, it says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And since he was unable to pay the debt, sorry, and since he was unable to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and he canceled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his own fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him. He began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me. 
I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had that man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and they told their master everything that had happened. The master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all of that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay all that he owed. And this time my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Man, I don't know there's a whole lot to explain there. I mean, it's pretty clear. A guy owes a massive debt. A king forgives it. He walks out. Some other dude owes him some money. He has to be paid. And instead of forgiving this other guy, he throws him in jail. The master's like, what? what? I forgave you? You won't forgive him? You're going to jail. Like, what in the world, man? And like, we could sit here all day. And I can, I can do all kinds of things to make us feel better about this text. Like, truly. There's all kinds of conversations we could have that would distract us right now. Like, we could ignore the drip of the text. We can ignore where it's driving. Here's what we'll do. Here's what we're going to do. To make this easier on us tonight, I'm going to start talking to you because there's this weird, this weird thing with this guy who was 10,000 talents. Let's just talk about that tonight. Because a talent was equal to 15 years wages. Uh, he owed 15, or, uh, 1,000 of those. Uh, it would take him 155,000 years to pay it back, and he owed $5.5 billion. Blah, blah, blah. This guy owed the equivalent of $5.5 billion. That's what he owes. We could talk about that. We could talk about the other guy. The fact that his debt, like a denarii, was a day's wage. You owed 100 of those. This other guy owes like 15 grand. One guy is $5.5 billion. One guy is, let's just not, why, what, what, what does that matter? Like it's not really the point of the whole story. We could talk about like biblical currency <laughs> and get totally distracted by some little tangent of history. But that, that's not the story. Well, we can dive in, honestly. And we'll, we'll talk about like when the king was going to throw the family in prison and this other guy goes to jail. And what did, what did servitude look like in that day and age compared to slavery in our culture? Like we could talk about the social norms and what, what happened when people owed money. But I don't, I don't think that's a story, man. I think, I think it's me trying to dodge the real issue. I think it's me just kind of ignoring the drip that's, that's right here. Or maybe, maybe you just want to talk about, you know what, Jason? Let's stay away from the real issue. Like, and let's just talk about how bad debt is. Like, let's get into that. These guys wouldn't be in trouble if they hadn't had so much debt. I mean, we could have that conversation. But honestly, man, we're, just in, we're ignoring the drip. We're not paying attention to the real heart of the text. But it's easy. I want to talk about all this stuff because I don't want to deal with the reality here, man. I don't want to deal with my own sin. I don't want to deal with my own problem. Like, I don't want to deal with my own struggles. So part of me just wants to do what I want to do that day in my basement and just ignore it. Spray a little Febreze. Let's get out of here. Let's do another dance party or something, man. But let's don't talk about this for crying out loud. But, but I think the text is clear. And maybe, maybe what Jesus is saying, maybe we just don't quite understand it. So let's, let's look at it again. Verse 21, that Peter came and asked Jesus, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to settle, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was unable to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay that debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he grabbed him and began to choke him, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me. I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had that man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened... They were greatly distressed, and they went and told their master everything that had happened. And the master called the servant in, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had, can't have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And anger's master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. So what's it about? I mean, I see a pattern here that's beautiful and hard. 
This is a pitiful and difficult situation. You got one guy that owes like 5.5 billion. Ain't no way he can pay it back. In 155,000 years, he couldn't pay this back. The problem here is not the king. The problem here is the servant. He has a debt that is absolutely unpayable, a debt that he owes that is on him. And the truth of the matter is, as much as I will and hope to give you good news tonight, I got to start with some really, really honest, some honest bad news. Here's the bad news. That debt, that debt is not even as bad as one we owe. See, we owe a debt like this man, but our debt's even worse. We owe a price that we can't pay. And you're like, well, what what in the world? What do you mean? What do I owe? The God of the universe says that when you sin, the wages, the payday for that sin, kind of like when you're speeding and you get a speeding ticket, like there's a fee associated with that. That the penalty for sin is death. And in fact, if you look at the scriptures in Romans chapter 6, 23, you'll see it right here behind me. The payday for sin, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The truth of the matter is our sin is bigger than 5.5 billion. Our sin is so great, so huge, that the only way it can be paid back is with our life. And at that moment, the God of the universe looks and says, I will pay that debt for them. The God of the universe, they have this conversation and say, I'm going to take Emily's debt. I'm going to take, you know, whatever your name is. He's, Jesus says, I will take that debt on myself. The king of heaven has called your marker and you're short. And all debt has a price. But just like this story here, you, we read the story. We're thinking, well, you know, this king, he could just, he could just ignore it. No, no, no. No one ignores $5.5 billion dollars. When there's debt, someone will always have to pay. In this story, the king eats the debt. The king bears the pain. The king absorbs it all. And in your story, the same thing is true. Someone has to pay for what you've done. Someone's got to pay. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Jesus, when he comes, you know, you you see him at Christmas in a manger and you see him go all the way to the cross. That is a story of him paying a debt you're unable to pay. He takes your debt, your penalty on his body and allows you to go free. Why does he do that? I think it's summed up pretty well in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 6. Through eight, it's really because of his love for us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In this place, in this moment, when you stand before the king with a debt you can't pay, Jesus steps in the gap and says, I will take it. I will pay that debt. And the father sees his life of no sin as a worthy sacrifice for your sin. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 12. It tells this beautiful thing about how Jesus views our sin. He says, I will forgive their sin, their wickedness, and will remember their sins no more. Not only does he forget it, but he actually even removes it. I love the way he words it. Now, sometimes I struggle with this, to be honest with you. I look at it at times, and it's hard for me to think God can forgive me because sometimes it's hard for me to even forgive myself. Some of you may feel that way at times, like, well, you don't know what I've done. You, you look at David, who's an adulterer. He's a murderer. I mean, he, we look into the Bible like he's some great guy. David makes mistake after mistake. And he says this, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. And maybe that's you. Maybe you feel like your sin is always in your face, always glaring you down. Let me give you words of hope from the book of Micah, chapter, verse, chapter 7. Micah says this. He says, who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? You don't stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all of our iniquities into the depths of the sea. And when Jesus takes your sin on himself... He hurls it to the depths of the sea. 
You can throw it as far as the east is from the west, that Jesus removes even the guilt of your sin and says, I have paid it. I have taken it on. I own it. And you get freedom. It's this moment, a lot of times you can find it in Scripture. No, you find it in Scripture, sorry. It's in, it's a, in, in a bit of like just, just history, that when, when somebody had a debt, they would owe a king or they would owe a government back in the day, you know, in biblical times. If they would take that debt and they would pay it off, you know, if you didn't pay, you're, you're in deep trouble. So when you went to go pay a debt, you'd walk before them, you'd hand over your money for your taxes, for the money you owed, you know, walk up, pay everything you owe. And then the cool thing was they would, they would take this stamp and they would stamp it. And it basically just said, you know, paid in full. That's pretty much what it said, paid in full right there. And so, you know, if, if anything ever happened, if somebody questioned you, you could say, well, look, I'm paid in full. If the king comes against you and says, hey, hey, did you ever pay your debt? Oh, yeah, I got that receipt right here. Yeah, here, here it is, here it is, here it is. Paid in full right there. Just shows up, paid in full. And the word that they would stamp on there, the word, Hebrew for that was to telestai. To telestai, stamp that word right on there. And when Jesus is on the cross, taking your sin, your iniquity, taking all of the wrongs that you did, recognizing that he was paying it. When he stretched out his arms and he says the words that it is finished, what he actually screams out on your behalf is, to tell us die, to tell us die. He paid it all in that moment. He paid everything for you. To tell us die, your sin is paid in full. And you get a chance to walk out Walk away from your $5.5 billion debt. Walk away from a debt that owes you death. And you walk out scot-free in that moment. Free. You leave the king's presence because to tell us die, his death pays it all for you. And I know that's exciting. No guilt. No paybacks. I mean, I know for me, it transformed my life. It's why I'm in ministry today. When I finally at your age, came to terms with that theology. I was just like, I had a death sentence and I'm alive? Like, like I'm on death row and now I'm alive? Like, it changed everything for me. In fact, the scripture that transformed me that night when I was a graduated senior was this, for Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and I read it this way, and therefore Jason died. And he died for all that Jason should no longer live for himself or if anyone died for him and was raised again, and it changed everything for me. I realized I was on death row and I was set free, and my life no longer belongs to me, it belongs to Jesus. Changed everything. But as much as I want to talk about it, and I want to leave you here super encouraged, and we can talk all about the good things that Jesus has done for you that are all true, we're still not dealing with the drip of this text. We're still not dealing with the real issue here. Sure, you feel good knowing to tell us die, but that's not the issue. So what is the issue of this text? Let's look at it again real quick. Maybe we can figure it out. We just read it enough. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. Peter probably thought he was being pretty, pretty gracious. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to settle, a man who owed him uh, 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was unable to pay him, uh, since he was unable to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay that debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and he choked him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. And this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. I think I'm starting to get the point. I mean, this guy leaves, and his voice has just cried out to the king. And that same voice is now yelling at another man. 
The same hands that walked in in that moment and, and, and begged the king, forgive me. Those same hands are now choking another individual. The same feet that walked in in the presence of a king, knowing with a debt he couldn't pay, those same feet are now going around hunting down some other dude that owes him money. Man, I'm glad this guy got his. And then I realized, man, I'm, I'm not much different because the same hands I lift in praise I can use to hurt someone else. The same voice that I preach with, the same voice that we sing with, the same voice that we talk about Jesus with is also the same voice that we use to condemn another person. And man, although you may not physically choke, you know what it's like to try to squeeze the life out of another person who's hurt you. And you'll make sure they get theirs. See, the king wasn't angry over the debt. He was angry over the abuse of a man who had been forgiven that refused to forgive. We're not the victim here, we're the abuser. You remember that Lord's Prayer you got yesterday in that bookmark? A little bookmark we handed out yesterday? It's interesting, there's a couple of verses that we didn't include on that from Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to look at those at the end of that. This is what Jesus says to us. Matthew 6, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. How's that working out for us? What it would look like if Jesus forgave us at the exact same level we forgive someone else. I mean, why forgive? I'm going to fire through a lot of scriptures really quick. I'd encourage you to write down the references. But I love what scripture says about forgiveness. He starts off, and, and you can see it in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 3. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Matthew chapter 5 verse 7, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Mark chapter 11 verse 25, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Ephesians chapter 4, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you in Colossians. Chapter 3, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgiveness is not a matter of math. It's not about sevens and seventy-sevens. It's a matter of the heart. Grace extended should be grace given. You owe a debt and you can't preach, sing, tithe, or do enough acts of service to cover. Only the blood of Jesus can cover that. And his forgiveness for you should be enough to encourage you to forgive someone else. So where do we start? Number one, I'll tell you, I think it's the hardest part of following Jesus. Forgiveness is a beast. It's hard. But I'll tell you that it's, it's not just a suggestion. I'll be honest with you and tell you that it's also a requirement. But I need you to hear this part. I don't think all debt is equal in this text or in life. Some of you have been hurt really, really bad. And I don't mean just because that boy broke up with you or that girl broke up with you. I I mean, some of you got a depth. I'm not saying that's true. I didn't mean to trivialize that because that does hurt. But I'm, I'm talking about a different level of debt where someone has brought violence into your home in such a way that you can never forget it or forgive it at this point. Some of you have have faced, be it physical or sexual abuse, and and I just want to tell you right now, listen, that's going to take a long time to process. And by no means do I think that, that by the time we get out of the room tonight, you've got to forgive some of those acts of violence that have happened against you. Not not alluding to that. But I am saying that for some of you in this room, you've got things that you know that you are capable of and should be forgiving. I'm not talking about these, these massive boulders that we're talking about right now of wrongs done to you. I'm talking about the daily things where we just won't forgive people. We can't let it go. We constantly gnaw at them, chew at them. We do everything we can to, to enact our little bits of vengeance. You know, we, we, we'll alienate them. We'll push them away. And all of that, we know we're wrong. I, I do believe all of us need to seek the ability to forgive. Whether it's a boulder or something small, we need to seek it. And for some of you that have, that have got that, that massive thing that's been done to you, maybe the best you can muster tonight is, man, I'm not ready to forgive him. I'm not ready to forgive her. Like what they did to my body or what they did to my, my family, what they did. Jason, you don't understand the consequence of how massive this is. And I'd say, I, you're right, I don't understand. So my, my simple request is, can you just tell Jesus, I'm not ready to forgive, but I'll think about it. Just start there. 
And I'll say this, I believe that Jesus can even forgive your unforgiveness. You need to ask the Holy Spirit for help. Forgiveness can come with boundaries as well. It doesn't mean that you've got to somehow, I'm not thinking, I don't want to read too much in the text, but I'm, I'm doubting this master loaned this guy another 5.5 billion. I think it's okay to set some boundaries in the midst of forgiveness, some healthy boundaries. What it looks like is when you get to the point that you stop seeking vengeance, you stop wishing ill will on them, you can get to the point that you can see them and not hate them, you get to the point that you can, you can actually hope that the good happens in their life. Forgive every time. And here's the truth of the matter, an apology is not the condition of your ability to forgive. An apology is not the condition. Because forgiveness is granted, it is not earned. So we're going to call some of you tonight to forgive. And I want to tell you what this doesn't look like. It doesn't look like you doing this passive aggressive thing that you know that some of you can do where you go, well, you know, Susie, at youth group time, I really want to forgive you because you're such a terrible person. And you hurt me so much and all the evil things that you did to me and all my friends. And I just want to publicly say that even though you're horrible, I want to forgive you. No, that is not what we're talking about. No, this is the condition of your heart and her apology and his apology is not the condition of your forgiveness. Forgiveness is granted. It is not earned. It's not faking politeness. You stop seeking their demise. I, I like what it says in Romans. Romans it says, do not repay. It's Romans chapter 12 if you're looking. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I think it's time for us to clean up our house. I think it's time to deal with the drip of anger and the drip of bitterness and not just spray it down with another, another good song. We can rush the stage. We can all raise our hands and act like we're spiritual. And that's wrong for rushing on the stage. I'm fine with that. But I'm just saying, don't fake it till you make it tonight. And by the way, you're not going to rush the stage right now because we do have some kind of work have you do. I think the point is, is not just mask it with another youth group game. I think the point of this is that you don't just kind of, well, I'll just get through it. I'll just wait long enough until I'm over it or until we're no longer in the same high school together or I don't have to see them anymore. No. I think tonight, you got to quit trying to Febreze this and you got to deal with the drip in your own heart that's leading you to be bent towards malice, leading you to be bent towards envy, leading you to be bent towards rage, leading you to be bent towards anger, leading you to be bent towards bitterness and say, tonight that stops in my heart. I don't want the culture of the kingdom to be one in my heart that when people look at me, they know I'm a Christian but I badmouth other people. I can't be that kind of person. Let's get rid of the stink because the slow drip in your youth group and the slow drip in your heart has caused tremendous problems. Unresolved, it's gonna wreck your mental health. Unresolved, it's gonna wreck your physical health. And unresolved, it's gonna destroy your spiritual health. It's doing more damage, we think, Everybody wants to be more like Jesus. You realize there's no time in your life when you can be more like Jesus than when you forgive another person. If you want to be like Christ, if you want to be Christ-like, your best opportunity to express that is in forgiving another human being. The power that raised Jesus. I know you're like, I can't do this, Jason. Okay, I get it. I get it. But the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that created the oceans and the mountains, the power that created the stars, that power resides in you, the Holy Spirit. Have you asked the Holy Spirit, Spirit, I can't do this on my own. Will you help me? Forgive because you've been forgiven. Forgive because Jesus requires it. Forgive because it is best for you. Forgive because it is a witness to a world hell-bent on revenge. And forgive because it is the culture of the kingdom. I'm going to ask you to stand. And I want you to listen to this text one last time. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, what are you supposed to do about this? 
what is the Holy Spirit telling you to, to do and who do you and who, I'm thinking, Lord, who do I need to forgive? Regardless of how they feel about me or I feel about them, who do I need to forgive? Their posture, their words are not the condition of my forgiveness. How sorry they are is not the condition of my forgiveness. That's not the issue. The issue is my heart. Well, I choose to forgive. Well, I choose to take the suffering that I think they deserve and own it myself. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, and I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And since he was unable to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. And the master called the servant in. He said, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. I'm going to ask you to deal with the drip tonight. Not in ways you guilt trip another person in this room or guilt trip your mom, guilt trip your dad. I'm asking you to authentically go before holy God and say, I need to forgive. I need to quit talking about this person bad. I need to quit thinking bad thoughts about them. I need to quit hoping bad things in their life. Jesus, you forgave me. I, I want your help forgiving them. Who is it? You know you got somebody in your mind. Whether you wrote them on that stick or not. I got people in my mind. You got people in your mind. The question is, are we going to deal with this drip? Or are we going to let it tear our house apart? Are we going to deal with this drip? Or are we going to let it tear our house apart? Just stay there and think about it for a bit.